Yeah, welcome to this online event that Merix is holding together with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. You can see Christoph Plate, our colleague already in, no, in Johannesburg. And um, I think Joseph will be there in a second from joining us from Nairobi. Um, my name is Kerstin Lose Friedrich, and I'm the Director of Communications at Merix. Before we start, let me briefly note, this is always important. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be accessible to the public by tomorrow. If you would like more information on our data protection regulations, please visit our website, merix.org. But back to our topic of today, telling China's story well. Some people ask me, why did you choose this title? Well, as you may know, this is a quote by Xi Jinping. When he visited party state media in 2016, he urged them to create flagship media with strong international influence in order to tell China's story well. But actually, and this is something Joseph will tell us later on, it started much earlier that China recognized the value of controlling foreign media as tools to foster a positive image of the country on the one hand and realize China's soft power strategy on the other hand. Since then, you know, China invested billions of US dollars in its discursive power. Today, we want to discuss these developments in China and in, in, we want to discuss China's information strategy in Europe and Africa, and we want to compare these two cases. And we want to look at China's changing influence toolbox and new target groups. Let me shortly introduce our panelists and today's agenda. And let me just switch here. Um, Ivana Karaskova, she's not only a European China policy fellow at Merix currently, but she is the founder and a project leader of Map Influence and China Observers in Central and Eastern Europe, and a China Research Fellow at the Association for International Affairs. Joseph Otindo is joining us from Nairobi. He is a visiting lecturer at Aga Khan University, Nairobi, and former editorial director. He worked for the Nation Media Group and the Standard Media Group, so very experienced journalist, editor, and editorial director. And last but not least, Christoph Plate, welcome from Johannesburg. He's the director of the media program Sub-Saharan Africa of Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and he is also a journalist by training. He was the Africa correspondent and an editor for Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Thank you all for joining us. And let's start. Discuss, we want to discuss um, the issues I just mentioned, but let me first uh, say um, how we want to proceed. We will have a short round of inputs by all the panelists followed by a discussion among us. And then there will be plenty of time for your questions. I'm sure there will be a lot of them. So Ivana, let's start with you. You have published intensively, not only recently, on China's rising influence in Central and Eastern Europe. Which tools does China use and how did they change in recent years? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kirsten, for your very uh, kind introduction. And thank you, Merix and Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for having me today. Well, before I uh, try to attempt or attempt to answer your question, I would like to first focus on the messenger itself. So what it means for China to actually have the propaganda? What is basically the background uh, behind that very briefly? Then I will focus on the audience. What are the focus groups we are actually talking about? Who is China trying to influence? And third, on the message itself. So what it is that China is spreading and how this process was accelerated after the Hong Kong protests in 2019 and also COVID-19 crisis in 2020. So regarding the messenger for China, propaganda is actually, uh, has actually positive connotations. It's actually seen as a proactive tool in educating and shaping opinions to contribute to let's quote, harmonious society. So it encompasses all the facets of Chinese society, be it uh, the education, military, oversight over the press, news agencies, basically all the facets. And in about 1980s, China recognized the need to split basically, to look not only at the internal propaganda or the propaganda which is consumed internally by the domestic population, but also by external propaganda. So to uh, Positive, to build a positive image of China abroad and foster fa favorable interpretation of uh, China. As for the audience, um, this really is quite interesting because China attempts first uh, the top-down approach. So it's focusing on uh, social and economic elites 
Um, and then it started to encompass more and more facets of the society. And this top-down approach represents really uh, the view how China, China, China navigates, how Chinese system uh, internally is built and how it understands international relations and international societies. So first, when they come to establish the influence in Central and Eastern Europe, and that's the area I'm mostly familiar with, they really focused on politicians, on the politicians from the governing parties. Then they focused on opposition because today's opposition is next to government. And they, then they started to encompass more and more facets of the society. So focusing on opinion makers, future elites, general population. And this is, it's the general population I would like to focus most here. Um, Chinese modus operandi before 2019, so before Hong Kong crisis and also before COVID-19 was quite defensive. It focused mostly on spreading positive image of China as a benign country, as a peaceful country, as a country which wants to um, um, which wants to uh, provide win-win, so gain uh, access to infrastructure projects and basically contribute to the well-being of the mankind, to put it this way. And it also focused on traditional media first because it understood traditional media as the key media. Um, and this is also stemming from its traditional approach and its own experience in the domestic market. And the waste of operation, where did it offer the benefits, mostly financial benefits to local media. Uh, in 2017, we at Map Influence ran a project looking at how China is portrayed in Central uh, European countries. And we found out that in 2015, when the Chinese uh, company CEFC came into the Czech Republic and made it a head headquarter for its influence operations and also financial, in, uh, in, um, financial operations in Central Europe, it started to invest into media. And from the moment they invested in the media, those media outlets started to change the coverage of China from the moment one, from the day one of the investment. So not only the coverage of China changed towards reporting exclusively positively on China, but also the topics change. And those media who got invested into by a private company, actually Chinese CESC, uh, they started to portray um, more positively Belt and Road Initiative 17 plus one, so cooperation between China and Central and Eastern Europe in a much more frequency and much more positive light than 40 other Czech media which we mapped. So this led us to understanding that what actually happens when China comes and invests into media. And we also looked at paid supplements. That's another strategy China uses quite often um, where, it's trying to uh, where it's trying to insert the supplements uh, which are created by Chinese entities, sometimes Chinese journalists, sometimes by the Chinese embassy itself into local media. Um, you can argue that number of companies and number of countries is actually trying to boost the image of country and also uh, put paid supplements into the lo local media. But what is quite unique in those paid supplements, which are paid by China, is that not all of the supplements are actually labeled as the PR material. They are obscurely labeled as theme commercial uh, supplements, but not basically saying that this is the content which is generated by Chinese state entities. And quite recently, they also started to, uh, to influence through advertisement companies, which is much more difficult and much more, much more, I would say, dire, because despite the ethos we have about media, it's still business. It's still the industry which needs to generate profit and mostly it generates profit through the advertisement. So if you have an advertisement company, which is um, influenced and which, which is owned by Chinese entity, the likely outcome would be that the uh, favorable ad advert advertisement deals will be signed with those media who are covering China positively. We can go into more details if you're interested in Q&A section on that. China also started to venture into fringe media, alternative media outlets. And what is quite interesting here, once again, using Central and Eastern Europe, Europe as an example, because China arrived here as a, as a latecomer, China is um, started to establish its influence since 2010s in 2012 and so on. So it's quite interesting to look at Central and Eastern Europe from this perspective, how it goes to establish step by step the influence. And what is really interesting here is that China uses the same avenues as Russian influence in Central Europe. And you can argue also whether this kind of strategy is something which is coordinated. It could be 
um, one Chinese embassy doing this, the other one in other country doing that. So we looked at China ambassador OPAT uh, in 2019 in connection to Hong Kong crisis and Hong Kong protests. And what we found out is quite interesting as well here, um, at least for me, and that's um, uh, there are OPATs which are published in nine different, or these were OPATs which were published in nine different Central and Eastern European countries. So nine different languages, starting with Montenegrin, Albanian, Czech, Polish, Estonian, Lithuanian, you name it. But the OPATs were almost identical. They were identical phrases, identical, not only the reasoning, but really the, the identical phrases, which were allegedly um, produced by nine different ambassadors or chargé d'affaires. So this at least uh, leads us towards having some kind of basis for hypothe hypothesizing that uh, the influence and the, the attempts to influence is uh, really coordinated here. And all these avenues, which I just described, so in trying to influence the traditional media through various means, trying to influence the alternative media, were even accelerated with Hong Kong in 2019 and COVID in 2020 or 2021. So what we are witness witnessing here is the increase in propaganda activity, but also using usage of new tactics. So the old... Um, accounts on social media, which were already established pre-2020, started to produce much more content than before and started to, started to um, pump the Chinese narratives to the local publics in a much more, with a much more frequency. And an interesting case here is just to very briefly mention is China Radio International, which is Chinese entity, um, this Chinese media, which um, broadcasts in various languages, including six Central and Eastern European languages, which for example, in the Czech Republic has 888,000 followers. And we are talking about a country of 10 million, which means that approximately uh, every 10, person in Czech Republic is following China Radio International. But when you look at the composition of followers, you will clearly distinguish that these are fake, account, fake accounts or bots. And their sol solemn purpose is to amplify the message and to increase the rating of China Radio International on social networks. So this got really accelerated. They, China Radio International also started to pay uh, the, the followers if they record positive, uh, positive messages about how China is dealing with COVID-19. And once again, we have seen China hiding behind different uh, entities, be it advertisement companies or hiring PR companies to facilitate the insertion of Chinese articles into uh, local media, mostly traditional media. Ivana, may I interrupt you here and just add one follow up question. When I posted this event at LinkedIn, the manager from ByteDance reacted saying, well, China needs a lot of catching up and propaganda, especially in English language. Would you still argue that China's approach in reigning into other me countries media is unique or is it more following the Russian model or the American model? What would you say? Oh, it's a great question, one, one we can basically debate for hours, but I will try to be very brief here. Um, of course, we have to distinguish between public diplomacy and propaganda. Public diplomacy is something all the countries are doing, so it's not uncommon to have opads of different ambassadors in local media. What is, however, unique um, in, in Chinese approach is that they are really paying for the opads to be published and they don't like to, those opads to be edited at all. And they're also intimidating journalists who are trying to uh, shed light on what's going on with, with China. So journalists who are talking about Xinjiang, for example, or writing about Xinjiang by denying them uh, the visa, by, by asking them to come for a tea, to have a chat at, at the Chinese local embassy. And they are also uh, calling to editors of different media and arguing that journalists are not supposed to write about uh, Taiwan, for example. So this is quite different from what we do see as, let's say, legitimate attempts to increase the knowledge of the country and also to boost the image of the country. This is really uh, much more um, much more resembling uh, the, the coercive tactic or you know, punishment of, of uh, people who dare to, to say other, um, who, dare to, who dare to divert from the Chinese uh, narratives. 
Um, I hope I, I tackled okay. that. Okay, thank you very much, Ivana, for this first input. And let me turn to uh, Joseph. Um, Joseph, you have been a journalist for 40 years in Nairobi. Um, you were head at the launch of East Africa's first regional newspaper, the East African, and you have worked at Kenya's largest news organization. So you are really the perfect candidate to give us a personal insight and also share your experience with us. Um, Ivana just mentioned that it started like around 2010. I think in Kenya, it started much earlier. When exactly did the Chinese start to invest into um, African Kenyan media and what did it change? We can't hear you at the moment. You have to unmute yourself, please, Joseph. Thank yeah. you, Kasten. Can you hear me now? Yes. I first became aware of um, the Chinese efforts to gain influence in local media um, around the year 2004, 2005, I think thereabouts. And um, this seems to have coincided with the, with the transfer of, their, of the regional office of Xinhua, which used to be in Paris when it was moved to Nairobi. I think then there seems to have been a realization that um, Nairobi could be used as a launching pad. Uh, but then, even then, the efforts seem to have been desultory and more like, uh, as, uh, more, seemed to be driven by one individual. Um, but Zinua, the head of the Zinua operation in Nairobi, made a, a determined effort to cultivate uh, friendship with the local media. And for us, that's something op we are open to from all, all newsmakers, you know. You don't chase away your newsmakers, you don't chase away friends. They are always possible sources of news in future. But he, he, he developed a very close relationship with us, with the media. And one of the outcomes of that relationship was that um, he managed to persuade us to install a Zinua satellite dish through which you could get television content because we had a television station. And he pushed very aggressively for uh, use of Zinua content. I could understand that because that's, 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 that's um, uh, 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 a discussion we always had, even with the Reuters representatives and with the AFP representatives. But his line of argument always was, must you be held captive by the Western perspective of news? Yeah, you need to give this other perspective a chance. So we got to a point where we said, okay, we'll use at least two or three Zinua uh, stories in a week, um, just to represent the other perspective and also to show you that we are fair. We don't have anything against China. To be sure, there are some stories that Zinua generated, which you would not get from AFP and Reuters. And uh, right now, you, I think you will know that um, uh, they have one of the largest foreign correspondent networks in Africa that enables them or gives them a presence at grassroots level. And they're able to identify stories which the AFP and Reuters um, would not be interested in anyway. Um, but you also see it in the fact, the kind of stories that sometimes they generate human interest stories, which uh, I think this has been a deliberate effort to change the kind of orientation of the earlier stories. Perhaps they realized that um, their stories were not getting much uptake because they were dry. It was economics, it was poly hard politics, development journalism, if you like, what we call development journalism. But late, I was talking about 2006 when Zinua moved to Nairobi. What we have now uh, is, uh, we have a China Global Television Network, also has its uh, um, main operation base in Nairobi. We have uh, China Daily, which uh, publishes from Nairobi and Johannesburg. We have uh, a local radio of China Radio International. And then we also have um, um, Star Times, which is a paid television uh, privately owned, if you like, or it, they present themselves as, a, uh, as, as privately owned. It's a, but it's a Chinese enterprise. It competes largely with DSTV and other paid television channels. The, the point about this presence is that consolidated 
it is a very powerful weapon for projecting the Chinese perspective, if it, ever, it is ever necessary. But when you look at also the effect that has had on the local media scene, again, put together, it's significant, not on the journalism, but just the impact of their presence. One, together, they have created nearly 500 media jobs. Yeah. Um, on the electronic side, more than 200, 300 uh, journalists on television and radio. Um, there is, they have also brought state of the art technology. Um, and also they are training a lot of journalists, you know, and I'll be talking about the training as an aspect of the uh, effort to penetrate media, because it's not just training for the people they employ in these enterprises, but there's also a lot of training being offered to the uh, local, local media enterprise nation standard. In fact, when I was at the standard, we had to put an official stop to our journalists freely taking these uh, training opportunities. And we had to draw up a chart which would enable us to see who was out on a Chinese training at any given time, who was due to come back and who will go next. Otherwise you could find half of your newsroom is, in, is out in Beijing <laughs> undergoing training without you realizing it. Yeah, but there is, it's, it's, it's a coordinator of it. They have a very strong presence. It can translate into a very strong um, projection of the Chinese uh, perspective. And uh, this sometimes translates into um, conflict, if you like, between med uh, media, local media, and uh, the Chinese uh, representatives of the Chinese interests. When I was at the standard, apart from the trainings, there was also a very aggressive effort to give us advertising money. Now you have to hand it to the Chinese. They realize that media in Africa at this stage is going through a very difficult time because of the digital disruption, the flight of audiences and advertising. So they are very vulnerable. So we had almost a schedule of, you would get two supplements um, every fort, you will get a supplement every fortnight and that's four pages. And that's substantial amount of money in terms of uh, making, helping you to achieve your revenue targets. Um, then of course would have conversations and uh, some kind of exchange uh, arrangements. It would lay us all, leave us open to publishing commentaries. Uh, we would consider stories, which legitimate stories, factual, yeah. But only that they would get more play than uh, they would have received uh, if they competed as news about China. But the key thing about this, it it gives them leverage over media when there is a point, a difference of opinion. We had a serious disagreement with them when the standard published an investigative report on uh, the, the, the construction of the SGR railway, which is a massive Chinese investment in Kenya. Or rather it's being undertaken by a Chinese company. Yeah, it's a Kenyan project being undertaken by a Chinese company. It's one of their biggest projects in this part of the world. And uh, I went, we had a, an investigative report which exposed racism among the Chinese managers, but also questioned, uh, laid, raised a lot of questions about the contract. It was very lopsided and is costing the Kenya government a lot of money unnecessarily. Obviously there was corruption between the Kenyan officials and people on the other side. But the point about this was the reaction of the local Chinese office. First of all, the embassy, and the, their communication managers. They canceled all the advertising in the standard. Um, they withdrew the supplements and uh, they demanded really that we have to stop negative coverage of the Chinese. But in ordinary circumstances, a situation such as this is, you would get a protest from the people you have covered. You'd give them a chance to tell their story, run their side of the story and just check your facts. If you got your facts wrong, you'd correct them and apologize. That is not the way they wanted it handled. Later, we also published a cartoon of uh, Xi Jinping showing him as a puppeteer, you know, controlling African leaders, which is really what was happening. I think it coincided with the Africa summit in um, China Africa summit in Peking, Beijing. And uh, 
we, I, I received a very angry phone, phone call from the ambassador himself. Yeah, I remember the, the thing about that conversation was that why do we do this to um, China's leader when we don't do it to our own leaders? Upon which, of course, I pointed out to him that we caricature our leaders all the time. Then he said, you do that with your leaders, but don't do it with, uh, <laughs> with, with, our, with our president. Yeah, But that ended the relationship between the standard and the Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, represent, uh, re mission in, 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 in Nairobi. Actually, they migrated the advertising to the nation media group, with whom, whom they fell out with and, uh, much later. But the point about this is that their investment is closely tied to their commercial and political interest. And when they find it necessary, they will seek to intervene. I've talked to journalists who work for China Global Television Network, and the Zinua and those, those who operate here as well. And the point they make is that while on a day-to-day -day basis, you are allowed to operate like any other media house. These are local journalists. On big stories which touch on China's interests, you will receive advice, indirect or direct, not on whether to go slow or uh, maybe be actively discouraged from uh, going flying out to you know to to uh, to cover an, an event. Um, however, on a day-to-day -day basis, they actually operate as any free media would. Has this affected journalism in Kenya? I don't think so. The mainstream media in Kenya is pretty strong. It has a very strong tradition of independent reporting. And uh, I don't think that attempts by China to penetrate uh, the nation, the standard, the royal media services has in any way undermined our journalism or changed the way we look at things. Yeah? I think what it does is where they were not getting stories about China were not getting recognition. I think there's a greater sensitivity now and a willingness to play them up, but they have to be factual. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Let me stop you there. I have plenty of follow-up questions, but maybe we first um, switch to Christoph. Um, Christoph, I just mentioned before you joined the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, you were a journalist yourself and you also reported from Africa. Yesterday, you and your team at the Sub-Saharan um, Media Program published an ebook, which is also available. We will share the link um, and um, you can all download it from the CAS website. It's really interesting. I read it already and it's about their story. That's the title, how China, Turkey and Russia try to influence media in Africa. So please give us the bigger picture um, of China's rising investment and influence in African media. And maybe later on, we have some time also for the Russian and the Turkey part, but let's start with the Chinese one. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kerstin and Marix, uh, for having me and, and, and the media program um, on this panel. And good afternoon to everyone from Johannesburg. I'm delighted to see that so many people are interested in this topic from Europe, from China and Africa. And it shows that crises and challenges, I think, are increasingly globalized and interconnected. And the challenges that media owners and practitioners face on the African continent in the face of Chinese involvement might look different. But when I listen to Ivana and many other witnesses, at the core, the challenges are pretty similar to the ones in Europe and elsewhere. The media program for Sub-Saharan Africa of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung has been observing in the past few years the growing Chinese influence in the media. And these observations come about naturally when you interact with journalists and publishers at conferences on social media or when you have face-to-face -face meetings. There's the lecturer for journalism at a South African university whom I know, who was invited to do his PhD in journalism in Beijing and who is now being reminded time and again which country enabled him to go for a PhD. There's the Malawian journalist I met who went for a brief training in the People's Republic and now gets, who now gets telephonic reminders of how much one would appreciate a kind of a journalistic payback. And there's the journalism lecturer at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, whom I know, who's being pressurized by Chinese institutions to please start a media hub in Addis that they then could invest in. 
At our conferences, mostly with stakeholders in the media industry, the bottom line when it comes to China is that the sheer economic power that the Chinese bring into the media field on the continent is very hard to fend off. This starts with the possibility, Joseph Odindo mentioned it, of using Chinua wires free of charge. It continues with the offer of scholarships, further with technical assistance to broadcasters and very important regula regulatory boards on to buying into media houses and setting up own media enterprises in Africa. Together with our researchers like uh, Dr. Dani Madrid Morales, who wrote the China chapter in the book that Kirsten just mentioned, we observe that the China, Chinese media involvement is seemingly uncoordinated with different players involved, like universities, Confucius Institutes, the foreign ministry, private investors, the Communist Party. But these efforts all fall into what some call the digital Silk Road. In our new book, it is about their story. You will find a lot of figures and a historical ov overview of Chinese media involvement since the 1960s on the African continent. But I want to share with you some observations here, which have even been underlined by the pandemic. Topics of Chinese media on the continent that you find for free in lobbies, in lounges, uh, on public places and on the airwaves are on which side of the escalator should one stand, left or right? A new rose brand has been developed. A new Okapi is born in the national zoo. The president has opened yet another road, a school, a bridge, a factory. You can imagine that many heads of state in Africa love such news. To win hearts and minds, they don't only use the big media, but it is done very cleverly. Community radio stations are being used. I witnessed that in Mozambique, for example, where on community radio stations, they uh, offer Chinese language classes and they promote Chinese language competitions. Chinese media is extremely good in finding a language for every audience, depending on the respective society and its challenges. That's, by the way, something that many underline when it comes to Chinese investments on the continent, that they find a solution to every technical problem in construction and other parts of industries. But luckily, citizens in many democratically hardened countries, like Kenya or Nigeria, they do not buy the Chinese media propaganda, but their rulers do. The pandemic has proven that media consumers on the African continent, especially those ones in the growing middle classes, they know the difference between the positive journalism that Beijing propagates, that doesn't ask uneasy questions, and on the other side, the classical ethical journalism that tries to serve as a gatekeeper, as a help to readers and media consumers. The emotions of African journalists that I meet working for Chinese media remind me of those of journalists that I've met 30 plus years ago in African one-party states or in Eastern Europe. Those days, what made journalists overcome their fears were issues like freedom of speech, democracy, multipartyism. Today, it is the fear to lose a well-paid job and having to look at oneself in the mirror. But we know of many examples where people withstand the financial temptations in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, in Nigeria, because there are colleagues who say, they are journalists and publishers, and who say, I didn't become a journalist or a publisher just to follow uh, somebody's one party state ideology. I became a journalist and publisher with a vision and I want to work with values that I embrace. To close up, Kirsten, there are many challenges ahead and I think it is of utmost importance to support media that sees the fourth estate as essential in building and defending democr democratic societies and to further critical debate about the best way forward. And to the classical media that Joseph Odindo and many others who are listening now represents, the serious media, the good media, the media that has verified its facts has still to become better. And that is a daily challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. You just mentioned that China is not really following a coherent strategy in um, bringing forward its influence in the African media landscape. But if you look at the other players in this field, um, what about the governments? What about the civil society? You mentioned the journalists already, but is there a kind of 
opposition towards this influence? Um, do they realize um, how fast is it going? How aggressively the Chinese side is investing? And uh, what what are any ways out of this yeah situation? Well, Kirsten, there is a growing there is a growing awareness in many civil societies. There's also growing awareness about um, uh, amongst amongst some politicians, um, especially during the pandemic. Many governments, including the one here in South Africa, they their hands were bound, you know, because Jack Ma and the Chinese government they sent all these face masks and and ventilators and other things. So they couldn't really uh, discuss that openly, but in civil society and in the media, there is a lot of debate and the debate is growing. But I think what we have to do is we have to, uh, just like we are sensitizing ourselves and societies for the danger of fake news. And we talk to politicians and journalists how important it is to verify news before they are being published or being uttered in parliament. I think it is very important to also sensitize ourselves for what is good media and not only what is good media and what is not so good media, but what is propaganda and what is uh, verified news. I also want to add that there is a growing uh, discussion on the African continent about the very fact that China and Chinese media, they are using the free media space in many African countries that civil society has fought for in the 1990s and thereafter. And subsequently, the, the, the airwaves were liberalized and there was a free media market. So China is moving into this, into this market and trying from their point of view to make the best out of it. Whereas reciprocal, no uh, foreign media company would just be allowed to uh, to broadcast in the People's Republic of China or to start a publication there. And there is a growing discussion there. Why should we allow them if they at the same time wouldn't allow others? Christoph, as you also look in your publication at the other players in Africa, Turkey and Russia, we don't have much time for that, but, but still give us an idea. Um, is China the, the big player, the big elephant in the room and the others are just there or what the situation at the moment? Yes, uh, China is the big elephant in the room. The, 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 the Turks are coming in increasing, increasingly with ever increasing numbers also of scholarships that are being offered and of training courses in the Turkish news agency Anadolu. And the Russians uh, are coming in, in in order to, should I say, um, um, initiate media coverage about some Russian uh, involvement, like when Russian uh, military personnel, when mercenaries are fighting in some conflicts in Africa, you usually also see an increase in media coverage on that, which is kind of friendly. Or when Russia sells uh, military hardware, the same thing happens. But clearly, China is the big player. Ivana, what lessons can be learned from the experience on both continents in Africa and Europe if you compare them? Well, I do definitely see the same problem outlining there, and that's the uh, robustness or resilience of the media ecosystem. And well, th this is basically re really stemming from how um, how good the system is, what it what what it can withstand. And I'm not surprised to see in other countries where the the institutions are weak or where the tradition of investigative journalism or journalism per se, such as in post-communist countries, some of them at least, uh, where this influence could be very, very disruptive. So as for the remedies, I really do think that we need to think about what it is that we should do for the for ensuring the freedom of media and plurality of media, investing into the strengthening of uh, media companies, investing into, let's say, investment screening mechanisms, which can block the unwelcome investment from authoritarian regimes into media industry, anti-slap regulation, which will shield journalists and, and media organizations from uh, lawsuits coming from, from um, actors which can basically afford to go into lawsuits, unlike the, the, the poor, let's say, media houses and so on. So 
On one hand, it's re it really starts in our own backyards, what we should do with our own media, how to strengthen them, uh, and so on. And the other one is, of course, raising awareness, because lots of journalists and also lots of policymakers, first, they still don't treat media as strategic industry. They still think that strategic industry is, let's say, uh, the telecommunications, it may be the airport, and, and so on. But media are actually, crucially, these are the watchdogs and these are the, the uh, avenues which can very easily change the narratives before elections. So this also has to, has to change and we need to work a little bit more uh, on awareness um, of what it is what, um, that the authoritarian regimes are trying to do with media. Joseph, I found it really interesting that you mentioned that the Chinese are also enabling a new kind of journalism which was maybe not known in Africa before, the grassroots journalism, and that they have the biggest network of foreign correspondents worldwide, um, or in, in whole of Africa at least. What reaction would you hope to see from Europe in the face of these trends? Would you expect them to invest more into also kind of new forms of journalism or training of journalists, or what would be your hope? You're still unmuted, Joseph. African media right now is uh, very vulnerable and is going through a crisis, like media elsewhere in the world. But um, it's, it's been a delayed effect in Africa. So it's right now that uh, media in Africa is struggling for survival um, against the effects of the digital disruption. And one of the things that I think the West could do is to help uh, the, the media, media on the continent to weather this storm. Because if the main media houses in various countries now collapse. It gives room to the outlets set up by the Chinese, you know, to assert themselves. Yeah, journalists become more, more desperate. Our best journalists will go off and you know get jobs where they are available. So that will only strengthen their hand. So one of the things I would ask, I would suggest, is that uh, the West should not look on. Um, I mean, back home they have allowed media to fight its own battle. If whatever they can do to help the media in Africa uh, reinvent itself, whether it's through technical support, um, um, business management uh, advice, or the training in the new ways of doing business, of the new ways of, uh, of doing media, this would help. We are doing it already on ourselves, so all we'll be getting is help. We are not asking for the kind of support that governments uh, normally get. The other thing, of course, training would be very important. And this is to counter the effect of what the Chinese are doing. Yeah, if, uh, if, if you allow the numbers of journalists operating in our space uh, uh, who have Chinese training to outnumber those who have had training elsewhere or have had training locally, then you can expect that their influence will, uh, will, 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 uh, will prevail. And uh, thirdly, I would say is to encourage investment um, um, in, 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 in local media. Uh, lastly, I would, I would echo what one journalist who works for, uh, for, for, for a Chinese enterprise told me, that for as long as local media maintain their tradition or their belief in independent journalism, and for as long as we have the presence of strong Western media outlets in our, in, in our space, then um, it is a strong enough bulwark against whatever the Chinese uh, want to achieve. At least for us, there'll be, there will be diversity. But looking at it from the Western perspective, to protect their interests, do not let Reuters, AFP, and uh, all these other agencies pull out of Africa, as they had done, yeah, as they had done when they were cutting down on their foreign correspondents, they were cutting down on their presence out here, the whole of Africa was being covered from a, by a correspondent in South Africa. This is what gave the Chinese room to do what they're doing right now. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Christoph, what would you say? How can we in Europe support constructive and also critical journalism in Africa? You're still unmuted, Christoph. <laughs> I was, yes, I was, I, I was looking at this, uh, at this remark where one of the participants was asking whether it's possible to put all the panelists on the screen so that we can see one another. Uh, I can maybe there uh, would be a finish the possibility like that. Um, 
but what can we what can we uh, do, Kirstin? I mean, the, the the media program of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation um, tries to do exactly what Joseph is doing. Not so much uh, in the training field, but more like bringing together the stakeholders in the media industry and discussing together different ways of, for example, tackling the challenges posed by the Chinese or uh, bringing uh, people uh, together to discuss the credibility crisis of the media. I do also think, and Joseph and I have discussed that uh, many times that um, we witness in many newsrooms on the African continent that you don't have gray-haired people in the newsrooms anymore. You have very young ones who, um, who, 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 who can't remember how one would deal in a situa situation under political stress when one has to make an editorial decision within five minutes or something of that sort. So uh, together with Joseph Odindo and a few others, we are trying to uh, bring together more the, the young and the old ones. I still wanted to add one aspect. I think when we talk about media and Ivana, who was, who was talking about Chinese diplomats using uh, Twitter and other issues, I think when we talk about media, we also have to broaden our outlook. I mean, this social network that is increasingly popular on this continent is called TikTok. And it's Chinese, and you can you can you can receive TikTok news now, and that's what the young people uh, will consume in future. I mean, we will have a time when Facebook is out and TikTok is the thing, and we also, as media practitioners and our colleagues who are publishers and media house owners, we have to address such issues as well because that's where some of those battles for the hearts and minds are being fought as well. Ivana, you are used to provide recommendations for all kinds of stakeholders, but also for the policy level. Um, what would be your recommendation? What could be done to maybe stop the Chinese influence or to minimize it or just to, to at least be aware of it and encounter it in any way? I have to say that I'm not a big fan of banning everything. So I do um, believe in plurality, even if this plurality brings uh, let's say idiotic ideas. Um, so I would still stuck with with uh, raising awareness, really, and um, increasing understanding that what China is doing isn't, by all means, isn't the same what the other countries are doing. This is much more dire. This is much more covert, and it's much. It has much more uh, dangerous effects on the society. It's really on the in the same basket as the Russian influence, and we are very much familiar with the Russian influence here in Central and Eastern Europe. But the level of knowledge is still very, very limited. I would say on all the facets of society here. So that's that's one thing is to increase the awareness and also to uh, up update the media laws we have. Uh, media laws in Central and Eastern Europe are very, very obsolete. And the problem, um, and I'm even not touching Hungary here or, or Poland. And the problem here really is that journalists do not trust the government. So they are quite happy with the obsolete, non-effective media laws because they fear that it may be even worse. And governments also love the obsolete um, media laws because it enables them to influence media, such as when they nominate uh, political leaders to sit in broadcasting councils, councils of public media. So that's that's one one problem we have to really once again tackle ourselves. China didn't invent the problems we have. China and Russia and other influences just using those problems. So we really have to start uh, on, on our own um, background, backyard here. And uh, regarding the future, I don't think, I think that we have a very small window of opportunity, actually a luxury here, because we already learned what Russia is doing. And we have capacities and years of experience debunking Russian myth uh, and working with Russian or working against Russian propaganda. So we have this small window of opportunity to actually adjust and to also um, um, grow our antennas against the Chinese influence and shield ourselves because China is going to be much more effective than Russia ever was. China has the means, it has access to AI, it has, um, and, and it has financial resources to actually learn from Russia and use all these avenues which it's already started experimenting with to a greater extent. 
Thank you, Ivana. Before we start the Q&A session, I would like to ask all of you, the three panelists, um, to give, provide us an outlook. Um, Joseph, what do you expect the situation for media to be in 2030 in Kenya? You're still unmuted. Do you mean the Chinese media or? Yeah, I mean, what will be the situation of Chinese influence in Kenyan media by 2030? Will it increase yeah. by then or what will be the situation? Well, I'll start from the point that um, the, the, the growth of the Chinese media has been closely tied to the growth in their economic and political interests in, in this part of the world. Um, it, it's it, the media, they have obviously seen the media as a useful tool for their um, political goals and for their expansionist interests. Now, because these investments are growing astronomically in this part of the world, and therefore discussion interaction with the local political establishment and interaction with the local po commun communities um, is also increasing, I think there'll be a, a determinedly higher investment in the media here. And even the quality of media, the management of information will be a lot more sophisticated and polished because there'll be a more urgent need to influence uh, conversation about their interests, what they're doing in, in this part of the world. That's, that is for certain. Um, I can see um, them upping their game, for instance, in the pay TV area where they have not been very successful because of poor programming, poor programming and weak marketing. They can address that. They can address that. After all, DSTV is suffering a lot and everybody's going to Netflix. They'll come up, come up with their own Netflix to counter that. So I can see an increase in the Chinese media presence and I can see it becoming more sophisticated um, uh, and, 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 and made more effective. <laughs> Sorry, now I muted myself. Ivana, what is your outlook? What will the situation be in 2030 in Central and Eastern Europe, maybe the whole part of Europe regarding Chinese influence? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be very, very optimistic here. I really think that we are looking at uh, increased uh, Chinese influence here, much more covert, uh, much more, much more uh, clever, I would say. And um, so far, China basically started with the, the public diplomacy, then injecting propaganda, moving towards disinformation in 2019 and 2020. I think that if I have to project until 2030, I will basically be afraid about deep fake news, uh, about creation of news through artificial intelligence, using very clever methods to, to um, reach all facets of society, be it through, let's say, WeChat and other form, and other closed door, let's say, platforms, which uh, targets directly, for example, Chinese diaspora, but also other, other means of communication, which uh, are, let's say, less, um, less visible than the traditional media. Traditional media are accessible, are quite visible, and are like on the silver plate for analyzing. But these could be very interesting avenues. And also what I would be afraid is the localization of news. It already started in Czech Republic. There is, uh, there is an interesting experiment run by China Radio International uh, with their uh, special TV studio, The Mole. That's the cartoon character which, which we like in Czech Republic, where they are trying to convey messages in Czech language so far very inefficiently, I would say, and so far quite quite uh, obviously, and lots of, lots of people ridicule that, but they are slowly getting better and better and increasing really from a, a small base of followers to those 800,000 followers, so far fakes, but but could be could be increasing in future with real people. So I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be optimistic. Thank you, Ivana. Christoph, what about you? I'm alarmed and optimistic uh, at the same time. Um, Every day I see more Chinese built uh, four wheel drives on the streets in Johannesburg, which look more and more like Japanese four wheel drives. And in another 25 years, I'm pretty certain that most of us will fly on Chinese aircrafts from A to B and to C. So the sophistication that Joseph was talking about will also apply in the media. If you watch some of the Chinese television programs these days, 
um, and you wouldn't hear the language and the topics, you could um, imagine it's CNN or something, some, some, some other very, very professional uh, network. So this poses a challenge to all of us that we become more and more sensitive about differentiating the one from the other. Uh, this is a challenge for politicians, for teachers, for journalists and for others. And why am I optimistic for the African continent? Uh, number one, I still see a lot, a lot also of young committed journalists who particularly say why they have chosen this profession and that they follow a, a, a journalistic uh, code of conduct, conduct uh, which they will not uh, obstruct. And secondly, and that is uh, something that we realized during the pandemic, the growing middle classes on this continent have realized that if you want serious and good and credible information, you need to pay for it. A year ago, nobody of us believed that you could build up uh, paywalls to pay for good and serious media on this continent. Now you can. And that um, underlines the optimism that I also feel. Thank you, Christoph. So we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, this is for the audience. You have two opportunities, two possibilities to ask questions. Um, the one is just right in the chat, but actually I would prefer that you also use the raise hand function and then we can unmute you and you can ask it in person. Just introduce yourself. There are some, we will start with Thomas Tötling. Thomas Tötling, please. Do you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, wonderful. Hello, hello, Christoph. Hello, Ivana. Jumbo, Joseph, nice to see you all here. Um, I'm Thomas von Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin. Uh, my question um, is, um, uh, as you have mentioned, Christoph, um, I think we have to take care about, you know, not talking about only traditional media, but also about new forms of media, social media, like TikTok. I think this is a quite a game changer since innovation in this area was always with the US and suddenly we have an app like TikTok, which is attracting hundreds of millions of young people, yeah? also for political reasons. So maybe uh, you can give us some insights, what in your point of view are strategies um, uh, to count the um, you know, Chinese efforts in this area and not only in the traditional media. Thank you very much. Shall I answer this sure, right Christian. away? Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks very much, uh, Thomas, for your, for, for your question. I think um, here again, in the case of TikTok, it is important to try and sensitize people. You know, I mean, my daughter uses TikTok, but I talk to her about what TikTok is about, where TikTok comes from, what values TikTok might stand for, or what... Uh, stuff that she should not believe she might find there. And I think that's a challenge for, 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 for many, many, many people. We have to talk more and more about values. We have to talk about the fact that, I mean, after TikTok, there will be something else, Thomas, you know? Now there's a certain Facebook fatigue. TikTok is coming in, WeChat might be coming in. And after that, there will be something else. It's not that we conquer the one and then we are done with this problem. So I think it needs to be, a constant process. And I think one aspect that we haven't brought up yet um, uh, about Chinese media policies is that they are so present. They are everywhere. They talk about what they are doing. And maybe that goes sometimes a little bit against a Western understatement and all that. But we should also talk more about the good things we are doing, the values that we stand for, uh, the media projects that we run, we should talk about it in public, on discussion panels like this one, in universities and elsewhere. And I think that slowly but gradually could have an effect on some of the media consumers. Anybody wants to add anything on that, Ivana or Joseph? Otherwise, I go ahead. Um, let me read two questions combined from the chat uh, from Mr. Steinmetz and Mr. Müller-Hofstede on Africa. Um, there were several questions on the relative number of Western correspondents compared to Chinese correspondents. Christoph, do you have any figures on that? I know that uh, the Chinese have um, what we call stringers or fixers in, in, uh, in many, many countries, but these are usually 
local uh, journalists who are being paid on a retainer. And that is something that Agence France Press, for example, who have, in my view, the best correspondence network on the African continent, and Bloomberg maybe, um, are doing as well. So in terms of figures, I wouldn't be able to, to tell, but you know, if the New York Times Bureau in Nairobi may, maybe has two people, or the Le Monde Bureau here for Africa in South Africa, uh, in Johannesburg has two people, you could probably say that um, the Chinese big networks and the Chinese big papers and the news agencies, they have a lot more people so they can actually generate a lot more news. Okay, there's one question, uh, second part of this question, it's probably for both, for Joseph and Christoph. How far are the activities in social media a more disruptive factor compared to targeting traditional media? What would you say? How far? I'm sorry again. How far are activities in social media more disruptive than influencing activities uh, targeting traditional printed media or TV, radio? I, I, I think their efforts right now are still targeting mainstream media. Um, they do use social media. Um, for, and I do remember that when we ran the um, negative story about uh, the investigative story about the SGR, there was a social media attack on the reporter, Paul Wafula, uh, a vicious social media attack. They enlisted all sorts of you know, gangs. Well, you know what you call the digital mugging? <laughs> That's what they subjected him to. And uh, it was so nasty that you know, the mid, uh, professional organizations here, the Kenya Editors Guild and the Union of Journalists had to take it up with the Chinese because it was quite clear that these were, um, th these were trolls being, being uh, used by the Chinese. But the bigger part of their strategy right now is still targeting mainstream media. And understandably so, understandably so, because while social media reaches a large number of people and is slowly gaining influence, we are still in a situation where people still go to mainstream media to cross-check what they have seen on social media. You know, television, radio especially, still has a very, a lot of influence in, in our part of the world. Vernacular radio reaches more people. It is a lot more uh, taken seriously by ordinary people. And now the other thing I wanted to mention, um, I'm forgetting about what Christopher had said. Anyway, let's move on, I'll remember as we go on. Chris, do you want to add anything on that? Yes, maybe I can quickly jump on in. I, I made an interesting experience that I wrote, I wrote a piece for a South African newspaper just after the pandemic had started, where I was trying to elaborate on what could be the possible future of media after this pandemic. And this was then reprinted in Nigeria and elsewhere. And um, one of the chief, should I say, tweeters of the Chinese diplomatic service on Africa he um, he commented on that, and uh, or he retweeted it, and uh, but he he would not pick up any of the criticism of China uh, that was written in that piece because I had said that um, the, the 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 possibility that uh, media is being bought up by Chinese investors in these dire times is very real, and he would not even react to it. But I agree with what Joseph says. I think that at the moment, it's more like the diplomatic service and their mass diplomacy efforts, which are being promoted on social media. And that's where the West and particularly Europe are very, very weak. I mean, here on this continent, Europe is giving more money to counter the pandemic, for example, than China. But um, in the media or on social media, it's not present. Whereas Every ventilator that is being handed over deserves a tweet. That's the Chinese strategy. And it's very smart. Okay. Ivana, there's a question for you, I guess. Uh, what are the methods to monitor China's influence on media through PR companies? I, I, if I may, just one sentence on what Christopher sure, and sure. Joseph was also say, were also saying. Well, exactly the same happens in Central and Eastern Europe. So still the targeting goes to traditional media, but also to 
uh, alternative media outlets. So basically, um, everything which is which is uh, on the, on the websites, but not social media. Social media are something as a last addition, addendum to the China strategy. But of course, we are seeing more and more efforts done by by that by, by, by done by that, and also the lessons learned and increase of of the uh, efficiency in using them. As for the methods we use, I would probably dissect it into two parts: methods we use to analyze media and methods to use uh, in analyzing the Chinese influence in um, in uh, through PR companies. So for media, there's a number of things you can you can do. You can emulate uh, the, the research we did already in Central uh, Europe. We use Pulsar, we use CrowdTangle for social media and so on. So there's a lot of things out there which could be used to that. And as for the, the PR um, influence over PR um, advertisement uh, companies, uh, we have a very great advantage in Central and Eastern Europe, and that's the countries are really small, which means that you have a very high probability that you know someone who knows someone and who can connect you. So, and people talk. So what we do is basically that we emulate to a certain extent uh, the work of journalists, that we speak with people, we speak with former uh, employees of uh, media houses, we speak with former employees of PR companies, and we verify the sources. So it's never built on just one source, but a number of sources. And that's, that's how we uh, learn and exchange information also through Choice Network, China Observers in Central and Eastern Europe. So once we see uh, one interesting trade, let's say in Czech Republic, we check in Estonia, we check in Albania, but it is the same thing is happening and that's how we can create a bigger picture. There's a more general question maybe to all of you by Zikron Abelt. Um, how far are Chinese attempts supporting China's approach to challenge existing rules and norms of the global order? Christoph, you want to try and answer? <laughs> Yes, I mean um, it's very clear. It's very clear that um, those governments that I mentioned earlier on, without naming them all, who are very much in favor of uh, Chinese support and uh, Chinese help in these dire times, are of course very, very important votes in the United Nations, uh, for example. So when it would come to um, a very, really critical situation in the General Assembly, and one would start discussing. Uh, condemning China for, for something, the Uyghurs, for example, uh, many of those government, I mean, the treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, many of the, uh, many of the, the African governments, uh, I could think now of Kenya, of uh, Rwanda, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, they would probably think twice if they would follow such a motion. So by doing what they are doing, but not only through the media, of course, that these are attempts to change the existing order. I would also add on that uh, actually the, the existing order is already changing yeah, in our part of the world. Um, the Chinese influence of, in, uh, over governments, a number of governments yeah, is so strong right now that the way the Chinese are treated uh, uh, significantly differs with the way um, the locals are treated. I mean, we've had cases here in Kenya where um, Chinese uh, have been caught on the wrong side of the law, but where you'd have expected them to be deported immediately, you know, you know, there's a delayed response and it's almost as if there's consultation, um, you know, should we take them to court? Are you okay if we take them to court? You know, you, you get a sense that um, the government hesitates and thinks twice, yeah, tr tries to do whatever the action they take does not damage their other interests. So this uh, increased pre media presence uh, and or influence over media is, is all part of uh, a, a massive effort to change the, uh, to, to further change the existing order and the order is already changing. Thank you, Joseph. Um, we have two questions, um, or there are more people raising their hands. Um, I start with Simon Allison. So please start. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for this really, really interesting panel. Um, I wanted to, to ask more about, um, the, the, you know, you mentioned a little bit about what Russia and Turkey was doing, um, Christoph. I'm particularly interested in, in Russia and, and, and what efforts they're doing and, and how that is differing from what is happening um, with the Chinese efforts um, in the media space. Uh, 
Good afternoon, Simon. I, sh I should tell uh, the listeners that Simon Allison is, is the Africa editor of the very famous paper Mail and Guardian and of the WhatsApp uh, journal, uh, The Continent. Simon, I, I think I, I would refer you uh, for more in-depth reading to the publication that was launched yesterday. I'll send you the link to that just now after this, after this meeting. But I, I, I still think that um, the um, Soviet Union um, connections that are there on the continent are being warmed up by uh, some of the Russian strategists, also when it comes to media and when it comes to uh, creating kind of a favorable uh, um, public uh, sentiment towards, uh, towards uh, Russia. And in the, in the sense of Turkey, uh, it goes along uh, with other efforts by the Turks. You know, Turkish Airlines, as far as I know, is the airline that flies to most destinations on the African continent. So you also find more op-eds of the Turkish ambassador in the local media. You, get, uh, you encounter more African journalists who get scholarships in Turkey. But more in-depth, uh, will be, you will be able to find in the, um, in the publication. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Hannah Saalberg. Please go ahead. Hannah Saalberg? She's muted. Um, Can you hear me now? now? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, working as a China commentator for the Swedish radio, formerly correspondent in Beijing. Thanks for this really interesting information. Um, you gave a very vivid um, account of Xinhua's establishment in Africa, Joseph, and um, I was very interested to hear that. I would ask all three panelists if you could rest briefly summarize the investment trends or the emphasis where the money is going. Is it going from China now primarily into, for example, PR uh, firms? Is it going into social media? Is it going into more of those different radio operations, for example? Chris, have you want to start? Okay. Well, what we've seen in Africa, as I said earlier, the, the more visible investment has been in mainstream media. It's been television. You know, television has, has a high, very high, uh, what do you call it, um, and, and, and very high entry barrier. Well, it's becoming easier now with the digital technology. Um, and then, of course, there's a traditional news agency. As I said earlier, Zeno now has got the biggest foreign correspondent network in Africa, where you have a New York Times correspondent based in Nairobi covering four countries and maybe just relying on stringers, they actually have direct representatives. And those representatives then have stringers deeper into the interior. Now that's a very strong network. So a lot of their investment right now is gone into um, mainstream media, but as the mainstream media reengineers itself, it, they will already be there to take advantage of uh, the, the, the digital muscle that the, the mainstream media uh, develops. Maybe I can just add uh, to this question uh, very briefly. I, I, uh, next to the television investments that Joseph Odino was talking about, there is a lot of technological investment, particularly so uh, in state broadcasting institutions in many African countries. We have cases in, at the Zambia Broadcasting Corporation where people tell us that we are um, using Chinese cameras, Chinese microphones, Chinese this, Chinese that. That, of course, creates a dependency. And we even have, and I met, mentioned the regulatory boards, we even have uh, the Chinese getting into um, managing the signals that you need to broadcast, the signals that you need to broadcast radio and television. And if the Chinese ambassador in Ghana, then um, I'm now looking into the future, doesn't like what he sees on television, uh, reporting about the Uyghurs or Taiwan or some other contentious uh, uh, topic, he might just switch it off or have it switched off. So a lot of financial investment goes into that. And we should also not forget that on the African continent, Chinese technology companies, Chinese mobile companies, 
um, they have um, invested heavily into networks, which has a lot of positive side effects because the farmer on the hills in Burundi, he now can afford a, a, a simple smartphone and he can download an app where he sees how much he will get for the coffee that he picks in the capital or whether he should wait another two weeks before he sells his coffee bags. So there are also positive trends, but the technology market on the African continent is almost entirely Chinese into 3G, 4G and 5G networks. That's another big technical aspect that also plays into the media, of course. Ivana, you want to add? Sure. On Central and Eastern Europe, it's a little bit different. There is not so much investment into technology because, relatively speaking, those traditional media are doing quite well. I mean, they don't, do not need technological advancement that much, at least uh, those EU member states countries. Um, where the money is actually going is still to the traditional media until very recently, until the adoption of investment screening regulation. And the way how to bypass that, and that's the, the money which started to pour into PR companies, the way how to bypass that, well, there's actually numerous, but I, I don't want to mention them, but the one which was actually used, <laughs> so so it's, it's already out there, is to... Um, buy the media or invest into media in the form of option. So basically you do that, you lock um, the, the investment before the investment screening comes into the force. And then you basically just call the option and it, the investment screening doesn't apply to that because it's already considered a done investment before the investment screening is adopted. So there's quite quite a clever ways how to, how to bypass even the investment screening mechanism, but this was, um, but at least on the paper, it's good to have the investment screening. And what China has been doing here in this region is really experimenting with quite bizarre, I would say, um, media outlets. Um, it, for example, invested into one uh, radio in Hungary playing classical music, another one in Finland playing classical music as well. So uh, these are quite interesting uh, well, uh, investments into which cannot be said that these are strategic investments, but these are definitely investments which will um, get the foot into the industry. You will learn how to broadcast in a European environment. You will learn about your listeners. You will learn about the, the, the media landscape, the regulatory uh, bodies and so on. So uh, management style and so on. So this, these are bits and pieces how China started to operate in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. Now it's going to be much more difficult with the investment screening to pour money directly into media, but there are numerous ways actually how to bypass that. Unfortunately, our time is up. There are much more questions in the chat and also one uh, question left uh, yeah, for those of you who, re you who raised your hands. Um, have a look for the publication of Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And uh, today, Americs will send out its next edition of the China Briefing and there will be an interview vis-a-vis -vis with Joseph Odindo. So you will get some more answers you uh, we may haven't um, yeah, really had the time to discuss. Um, thank you very much to all my panelists. I would like to thank you, Ivana Karaskova, Joseph Odindo and Christoph Plate. And please let me also mention our colleagues in the back, um, Antonia von Selberschwecht, our technical host, Johannes Kast from Merix, who did the invitation management and David Merkel from Konrad Adenauer Foundation, who also navigate me a bit through this um, questions and the chat. Thank you all for joining and I hope to see See you soon. Um, please keep um, informed, use our different publications and um, sign up for our newsletter if you haven't and then you will be very well informed what is going on. I wish you all a nice rest of the day and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>